Chapters Secretary. Hello, my name is Izzy Anson. I'm a junior at Marshall High School, and next year I will be the Marshall FFA Chapters Vice President. Hello, my name is Andrea Gerlowski. I'm a seventh grade science teacher as well as an editor science teacher here at the middle school. I was hired as, a, um, as well as a middle school FFA advisor. But I also have the high school FFA chapter as well. Hi there. My name is Laura Finch. I am the high school uh, agri-science teacher and FFA advisor. And then I'm also helping with the middle school and helping Andrea transition into that role, which has been very exciting and wonderful. We want to thank everybody for having us um, today. And of course, to celebrate, we did end up winning two state championships, which was super exciting and especially <laughs> uh, especially in these times with COVID and everything kind of being virtual and hybrid and just kind of crazy. Uh, we also want to take a few minutes to just talk a little bit about what is FFA and what is agri-science education. So as everybody can see on our first slide, um, agri-science education covers all of agriculture, science, food, natural resources. And students can be a part of this organization in seventh grade through 12th grade. And then they can extend into college to actually get their American degree through Marshall Public Schools, which is pretty exciting. Uh, today we're going to just flash through a couple of the slides. And this little graphic on the bottom left-hand corner kind of encompasses what FFA and agri-science education is all about. Uh, we have classroom, laboratory instruction, where we teach classes. We have leadership, which is through the FFA program, which is intercurricular within our classroom, as well as beyond and after school and weekend events, summer events. And then we also have experiential learning, which is the supervised agriculture experiences, which is individual projects that each of the kids do. And if you could switch to the slide. Um, so as I was saying, FFA is an intracurricular leadership organization, and everybody always looks to look at data and numbers. So Andrea and I present, uh, prepared some numbers here for us. So currently we have high school botany, high school zoology, and high school agri-science, or advanced agri-science food and natural resources leadership. We have 165 students enrolled in high school ag classes this year, and I'm teaching five sections, and Mr. Griffith is teaching one section. And at the middle school, this is the third year that Marshall has had an agri-science 
program at the middle school. This is my first year um, kind of taking it over. This year we had a total of 26 students enrolled and it's currently only offered for seventh graders. So all those 26 students were seventh graders and we're working on offering it for eighth grade next year and possibly sixth grade. And we had a current total of 211 students through Marshall Public Schools enrolled, enrolled in Agri Science Education. And uh, this is our membership data. So just because you're in the class doesn't automatically mean that you have to do the FFA activities. Uh, we do a certain amount intracurricular within our classrooms, uh, but then we do a lot outside of those classrooms. So again, like Laura mentioned, we like the data. So we can see here in 2015 to 2016, we had 32 official members enrolled in the Marshall FFA chapter. As we move to 2016 to 2017, you can see that number drastically increased to 62. When we moved to 2017 and 2018, it continued to increase to 83 total members. 2018 to 2019, we ended the year with a total of 88 members. And last year, we ended the year with 98 members. And we believe that it would have continued to increase by the end of the year. But once we went virtual due to COVID in March, um, we kind of stopped getting any new members coming in that going virtual halted us there. And then this year, we had 93 official members, which given this year's schedule being virtual, hybrid, all the changes, we thought that that was still a pretty awesome number and we're really proud of that. So for the FFA chapter, we have a group of officers and we basically lead the chapter creating activities and we work really hard together outside of school to make activities possible. So this year, our chapter president was James Russelli. Our vice president was Mara Tiernan. Our secretary was I, Mackenzie Henniger. Our treasurer was Audrey Richardson. Our reporter was Caleb Green. And I was also our chapter historian. And our Sentinel was Austin Burkwell. And our, our advisors, are Mrs. Finch and Mrs. Berlowski. So for the next school year, we had a series of elections in order to pick out who would be our next chapter officers, our team. So for next school year, our team is Mark Tiernan as president, myself as vice president, Alec Burkwell as reporter, Maggie Burkwell as secretary, Josh Munson as treasurer, and Harrison Denbrock as Sentinel. So as we stated before, it's been kind of a crazy year, as we all are aware. I think everybody in the room is aware of that. Um, we are very proud of the fact, though, that even with a virtual sometimes, hybrid sometimes, in-person sometimes, we never really knew what was going on. We did make sure to follow all of the protocols um, set forth. Mr. Turner and I really met uh, very frequently to make sure we were on course. And this is just a short list of some of the activities that we still were able to do. They weren't exactly traditional in how we did them. We did have to shift and do things a little bit different. Um, but we made it work, and we're really proud that we were able to still do quite a few different activities. All right, and every year, the National FFA puts on this big convention um, for the whole, uh, the whole nation. This year, it was virtual. It's usually held in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, what the National Chapter did is they worked really hard. They put together this uh, website. It had a ton of resources from different agriculture industries, videos, um, a whole web map that the students could follow. And we actually still participated in this in class and after school. Um, so the kids still got a little bit of introduction to what National FFA is like. Um, at National FFA, as Laura mentioned earlier, we have um, different degrees that we can award, and we have one student earn the American FFA degree, and less than 1% of FFA members actually earn this degree. So to have someone from Marshall um, earn this is a really great accomplishment. Again, we're really proud of that. Um, and this award is based on the student's involvement in that three-circle model that you see at the bottom that Laura mentioned, the classroom, FFA, and SAE. 
Um, this includes the community service, participating in all the, the ag classes, and being a strong FFA member. And that is Morgan Hawkaw. So this year, we decided to do a demonstration about floriculture. So myself, Mackenzie Henniger, and Mara Tierman, and Stephen Turner, as our non-speaking technology member, worked super hard. We put in lots of hours, and we did this all virtually, and we made it to state, and we won the state championship. This was something that we put a lot of hard work and dedication to. Um, we spent from around December, all the way to April, meeting up nine hours a week. And we really worked super hard to be where we are today. Um, we did virtual meetings, all in order for us to prepare for our championship and for the contest we participated in. Yes. So in order to prepare for this contest, we, uh, uh, we met with local flower businesses such as the Harvester. Amy Friends helped us and sort of job shadow. We sort of job shadowed her to earn more information. And our demonstration was focused on the impacts of COVID-19 on small, small floral businesses as well as floriculture. In each round, we would meet with a, virtu a virtual group of judges and they would watch our 15 minute presentation. And at the end of the presentation, they would give us questions related on the topic. And this demonstration was mentally memorized and 15 minutes long. So we didn't stop there and we actually won a second state championship. And this was a junior high quiz bowl team. So the team is pictured up there. Um, from my left to right is Alex Finch, Thane Brownell, Troy Richardson, and Ryan Robinson. Um, they're all, or three of them are seventh grade, one is an eighth grade member. What this contest was, was a kahoot of 25 questions about FFA knowledge, history, and some of this uh, they learned within class. I had Thane and Ryan in my middle school ag class, and we learned some of this in class. Alex and Troy, they had to study outside of class, so they spent time on their own studying for this contest. So they competed in the Kahoot, we added up their scores. Once they made it through the first round, the second round was actually a live Zoom meeting. Um, and they went head to head with another chapter. Um, and it was a total of 10 questions and they came out on top. So that was our second state champion. pictures of a year in review. Um, these are some things within the classroom. We have a picture there. In our dairy unit, we made butter and we made ice cream. Um, there is a unit there about beef production, so they learned all the different meat cuts. Um, that last one was recently, we were learning about flowers and flower parts, so we went outside, drew chalk so they could practice the different flower parts. And then that is a picture of our greenhouse up there that the students grew geraniums within the greenhouse to sell at our plant sale fundraiser. And as we said, even though it's been kind of a crazy year with virtual and hybrid and Zoom meetings and all of that, we still had a great year. So here's some pictures strictly from our FFA events. Um, the bottom left there is a picture of our quiz bowl team with Alex, Troy, and Thane. The top there is a picture of us with our demonstration teams. We actually had two teams this year, and the other team didn't move on from districts to regionals, whereas we did have the other team that did win the state championship. In the upper right-hand corner, we have some kids putting together some packets for uh, National FFA Week to kind of celebrate that within the school. And then our bottom picture here is our kids that did end up winning a ton of state convention awards. So those are the outstanding juniors, the state degrees, and the state academic awards. So we're very proud of all of them. And like I said, we're very, very thankful and very happy that we were able to still have a great year with FFA. All right, we want to say thank you so much for our time and having us be here to present. Um, thank you for your continued support in agri-science education 
in our Marshall FFA chapter. And once again, thank you so much for being here and for your time. I just thought it's really impressive about how much it's grown over five or six years. And I was just wondering if you were tired, maybe sixth graders or seventh graders, or people who are really proud about the FFA. I guess the biggest thing is just that FFA has something There's lots of different parts. Um, just as there's lots of natural resources, and regardless what career you're going to go into, it's a good opportunity um, to develop skills. And I've been doing this job for, this is my 17th year, and, you know, it's not about, like, producing farmers or producing veterinarians or floral designers. It's just about making better people and, you know, more, better consumers and better parts of society, I guess. So, yeah. And it's fun, because you get until sixth grade. It's fun. And you eat a lot of food. So, yeah. You gotta grow that. So, thank you for having me. I'm um, just finish the... I think if I remember if my mind goes back that far, uh, this program is on Falcon Rock. Uh, and there was a lot of things for that. Not really. And I know you're a fan of me, and all that stuff, but thank you. Well, thanks for taking a chance. And you bet. Dr. Davis. When I called him and he said, Yup, we're meeting in class tomorrow morning. So, it was good. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to item four. Members of the audience may address the board. Individuals who wish to address the board of education are requested to complete a public uh, comment request form if you plan to make any comments. Each person will be allowed up to three minutes to address the board. highlight the lack of resources available for students facing for students and staff facing sexual orientation and gender identity issues. I have contacted Trustee Lankard who directed me to the policies of the district. The only area that had addressed the matter was the anti-harassment policy which has only given me a bare a not even a sentence. Now, I, this is on page two of the policy par paragraph, paragraph one, sentence one. The board will vil vigorously pro in its prohibition against discrimination and harassment based on race, color, natural origin, sex, parenthesis, including sexual orientation and transgender identity, disability, age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is the only place within the policies that it is addressed. Throughout the nine page policy, every other, every other type of harassment has been addressed in at least a paragraph. This one has been left unaddressed, which has left each school and each teacher to address it in their own way, shape, and form. Which has led to many problems. There are no guidelines or resources for, for students for students exhibiting for who have who do not identify in the gender binary. I strongly urge you, members of the board, to create guidelines or create some sort of of committee to address these problems so that all students do not slip through the cracks. Thank you. Hi everybody, 
my name is Jess Roberts, and I am a Marshall. I am the parent of a soon-to-be Marshall High School graduate, um, and I am also the director of Albion's Big Read. And in my job as the director of Albion's Big Read, uh, I have the happy work of thinking a lot about what it looks like to make reading relevant and joyful in the lives of young people. And that is what brings me here today, because I wanted to share with you my considerable excitement at the diversity through literature course that is being proposed by Julie Smith and Tony Barroso. That excitement is both professional and personal. I am excited because this proposal presents a syllabus that is full of books that are full of complicated black and brown and white young people living in our complicated and messy world. I am excited because this proposal is full of books in which students who have not yet seen themselves in our curriculum will see both themselves and the world in which we live together. And those kinds of books, in my professional experience, are the books that are most likely, that are most likely that students will, will make it most likely that students will experience literature as both relevant and joyful. I am excited because it is exciting to see teachers respond in meaningful ways to their students and to make something new for them. But I am also excited personally. I love many students at Marshall High School. And many of the students I love at Marshall High School are black and brown students. And I am excited that those students who I love will have the opportunity to take a class in which they will encounter characters who look like them, who look like their mothers and their fathers and their brothers and their aunties and uncles and cousins. I am excited that they will have a chance to see themselves and I hope feel that their school sees them. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Barroso, for proposing this class. Thank you for seeing our students and the need in our curriculum. Thank you to the board members for considering this proposal. I hope that you will offer them all of your support. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to pick up where my name is Nels Christensen. I live with her uh, in, in Albion. Uh, our daughter is graduating. Um, I want to pick up where Jess just left off uh, by publicly admitting to you that when I was uh, a little boy, I was a complete and utter uh, nerd. I was a nerd. And what I mean by that is I love to read. I love to read. I love to read more than I love to do anything else. So when Corey McCallis would come over and knock on my door, he's like, hey, man, let's go out and like play basketball. Or like, let's go shoot jackrabbits in the field. Or like, let's go set the field on fire, which is what Corey liked to do. I said, not because I thought it was bad to set the field on fire, I said, like, no, uh, I'm going to finish my book. Like, ah, I'm going to finish my book. I stayed inside and finished the book that I was reading, because that's the kind of guy I was. I loved to read. And that love of reading, this won't be surprising to you, uh, like got me through not being a really good student, actually. Like I was not the smartest kid in my house or on my block or in my classes, and I was not a very good student, um, but I loved to read, and it pulled me through. Um, and I think it also like, made me want to become a teacher, which I did, um, and wanted to like, share that love of reading with my students, which I have done for a long time now. Now, like sort of a point in time, I want you to imagine and you all know what I'm talking about. However many years ago this was, Randy's going to know. Uh, two, two things happened at once at, 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 in, in time. Uh, Albion uh, School District annexed with Marshall, and Albion College, where I teach, began to heavily recruit students of color. These two things happened at almost exactly the same time. Now, I had two realizations at this, one, at this time. One, the way I was teaching literature wasn't working anymore. My classes were filling up with black and brown uh, students, and the stuff I was doing and had done for 10, 15 years wasn't working. And I realized that maybe my love of literature, when I was a kid, came from the fact that every book I read, every one, comic books, fantasy novels, whatever, had a hero who looked like me. There was a white dude who was doing cool things among white people. And I realized, oh, every book I read was written by a white person for white people about white people. 
And I thought like, maybe that's where my love came from. Like maybe that had something to do with why I love literature because I saw myself in everything that I read. And then I thought, maybe, like, duh, and it took me a long time to figure this out. Maybe I need to like give the black and brown students a different books than I read when I was a kid. So I did that. I gave them books that I hadn't read that were written by black folks that had black folks in them that were for black folks. And suddenly my students, black and brown, began to love to read and they responded. Um, I'm ashamed it took me that long to figure that out, but it did. Um, so you see what I'm saying, I think. You see what I'm saying. And I suspect that whatever it takes to change curriculum uh, in a system this large is not easy and is not cheap. I do not doubt that that's true. But I also know that I've never done anything in my life that was worth doing, that wasn't uh, hard, and was cheap, if that makes sense. So um, I'm excited about this class that Jess just talked about, um, and I hope you all are too. Thanks. Thank you. 
Superintendency of Marshall Public Schools. Under his leadership, Dr. Davis has led our school systems to some of the transitions and partnerships with the institutions and programs in Calhoun County. In 2013, he worked with the state of Michigan in providing the educational services to resident students in the Michigan Youth Challenge Academy. That same year, he led the district through the Marshall Academy collaboration as a transition of all the high school students, uh, students to Marshall High School and later through the organization of K through eight students in 2016. Among the successful passage of the school improvement plan in 2010, Dr. Lewis has also signed and received many donations from the government of our school system and the students who serve. He was instrumental in winning the first early Middle College in Chicago County with the formation of the Eastern Carolina Early College Program at the start of the 2015 2016 school year. He led the school by serving for a couple of years. This in addition to the partnerships established with Evan College and the Catholic Community College to provide more opportunities for our students and for future teachers. Dr. Davis has been recognized for his actions to numerous awards with Stony County. He was selected by the National Association of School Administrators Region 7 to receive the 2014 Regional Superintendent of the Year Award. He received the Michigan Association of School Administrators Courageous during the Leadership Award. The 2014 WB was recognized as the 2014 Education Award for the National Area Chamber of Commerce. We see the 2015 Calvin Area School Board Member Association Professional Award for Distinguished Service Change and was presented with the Real Estate Champion Award for the Cross Ages Mentoring and Youth Leadership Summit in February 2016 for outstanding commitment to cultural and university programs for all students regardless of race or social or economic status by the student leaders. His leadership and passion for equity and inclusion has been recognized at the state level as he has tapped to serve on different committees for the government of education across the state of Michigan. The most assuredly, I could have gotten to mention. Suffice it to say, much of this school has been fortunate to have Dr. Davis at its helm for the past 12 years. Dr. Davis retired from the school district effective June 4, 2021, with a combined total of 18 years of dedication and commitment. So thank you. Thank you.
about um, COVID and where we have the most impact, what has led to our kids being sent home, most when our schools being completely shut down, left from quarantine. Um, you know, we haven't really looked at some of the outbreaks that have happened to really give us an idea of what we should be doing going forward next year. Um, and it's nice to think that you know, potentially we have an issue next year that we know is probably going to uh, start coming into the focus again in, in October, which um, I think that there will be a lot of kids um, that still get vaccinated. There will be some staff that still get vaccinated and so it's still not coming into our schools. So we could at some point in the summer to really take on the point at what's happening. person was talking about like things that we're going to we might need to add to our policies and our handbooks is there anything special that we have to do when we're doing that um no uh sean what we need to do is ask the um the superintendent to present policy relative to a particular topic area in your place administrative guidelines you can read that and the guidance that comes from the organization and if you want to ask for some support from the OR to or, or change anything you ask your program to do. Because we, you know, made a decision about what the handbook looks like right now and then January we say, hey, there's some things we might want to change, that's not that big of a deal in, in terms of how it gets done. It's not like because we we approve it now and we can't do another one until next year. Um, when it goes to print, um, you know, that's definitely a concern to make sure that that's out there so parents have a, a document that they can um, operate from and students can. Uh, we usually want to have that completed before the uh, beginning of the school year. Okay, so I can look at it. If you want to June, and we still plan for us to make adjustments. Okay, thank you. Yep. The only thing I had a comment on is um, I appreciated some of the middle school changes regarding press code. Um, being in alignment more with the high schools for, for kiddos. And when uh, it gets warmer, we inevitably have some dress code violations. And again, that happened at the middle school. And I, I think uh, this is a good talk for communicating to parents about the potential violations. However, we know that a lot of, I don't know, so I'm going to assume that most of those violations were against uh, females. And so I appreciated loosening some of those dress code requirements because we are about educating kids and not making sure that they um, we mandate what, what they wear. 
So I appreciated the flexibility in the middle school administrations and the changes that are reflected in the middle school handbook for 2021-22. Uh, no, move on to uh, C English uh, 12 Diversity Through Literature course proposal. You have the um, Marshall Public Schools curriculum proposed uh, format. And Julie, you ready to present? Yeah. Good evening. My name is Julie Smith. I have been teaching at Marshall Public Schools for 18 years. 15? I know. <laughs> I've been the advanced placement and English teacher as well as the English 12 British literature instructor. Yeah, I do. I have my master's in curriculum and instruction as well. I'm uh, Tony Barroso. I've been with the school district for 13 years. I teach currently ninth grade honors and 11th grade as well too, both English. And I have a master's degree in literature. So we are proposing for you a new class at the senior level. So it's a little confusing for, I realized in the um, process of getting here tonight, um, what we take for granted on just knowing. So I'm gonna kind of lay out what happens at that senior year. Um, freshmen, English 9, English 10 sophomores, English 11 juniors, and then we branch out at that senior year. It's a little like old country buffet, if you will. You get to pick. So you, we have the English 12 Technical Science Fiction. These are for our students, not really aiming for that four-year college degree. We're going into the trades. Um, we're going into the armed forces. Or maybe they just, uh, this year I had a kid who just liked science fiction. So, hey. Um, then we have English 12 British Literature, which is a college uh, prep class. So we do a lot of college writing, scholarship writing, things to get them ready to leave the halls and walls of Marshall High School. And then the advanced placement, which is a college level course. We are proposing an additional college prep course called English 12, Exploring Diversity Through Literature. So those will be the four choices for the kids, hopefully starting next year. Uh, let's share some pieces from the background section of the proposal here for you. Students should see themselves in their curriculum. The typical literature can is predominantly taught in Marshall High School, while there is some merit to some of these texts st uh, stating that there is a depth and breadth of our common national experience. We are realizing now that what we once defined as common, middle class, white, cisgender, is no longer the reality of our country, nor of Marshall High School. Marshall High School needs to be overt in providing a curriculum that re represents all students. At the senior level, the curriculum established at Marshall High School is British Literature, AP, and Science Fiction Fantasy, as we just discussed. Adding a course that provides mirrors so that our students can identify with characters and authors that represent their cultural experiences, but also give them windows to see other diverse groups is necessary to give the students as an option. We are losing our students to authors who don't look like them, sound like them, or discuss real issues like they are experiencing in 2021. That's right. So there's four kind of goals to this class. We want to provide mirrors. It's important that people see themselves in the literature that they're reading. I too, right? I too read books written by white people dealing with white people and in white people culture. And I, I taught that for 18 years. And it, it's been a series of events that has led me to, what am I doing? I, I need to provide a mirror for all of our kids so that they too can see themselves in the world. That they too can hear names that are similar to their, their own. I had a girl last year, she's like, I've never read a book until now that had a name like mine. That blew me away. We need to provide also kind of these windows where we can look out and see other cultures. And what issues are those cultures grappling with? What are those teenagers dealing with? And a lot of times I think that we can find a commonality between these things. 
And then we can open those sliding doors and engage, engage with other cultures, share what we know, and learn. That's what this is. It's gonna be learning for both student and teacher. And at the end, my hope is that there's like a capstone, that there's a social action. We've learned about this, but silence only gets you so far, it's not far at all. We need to take action and we need to engage in our community. So that is kind of the four goals of this class. I'm um, gonna share from the course description portion here. Students will explore diversity and discover joy and genius in marginalized people through reading of modern texts, both fiction and nonfiction, and visual literature and critical writing. Fictional pieces will center around various diverse groups, including black Americans, Latinx, and LGBTQ+. Nonfiction pieces will include essays from NPR's This I Believe, Rethinking Schools, magazine articles, among other relevant readings. Viewing and listening standards will be achieved through documentaries and film. Writing will include post-secondary necessities, such as scholarship writing, college application essays, and resume writing as needed. Journal writing will be part of the course, offering students a way to grapple with and respond in various forms to topics discussed in class. And literary responses will range in both formal and informal. So right now, uh, with the help of so many wonderful people, um, we have now created this class with really kind of four main units. So the first one, and maybe equally as important and, and taking as long, is, is this foundation of how to speak about these issues that are, can be intimidating, they can be, I'm not sure what to say, and creating an atmosphere in the classroom so that everyone is learning, everyone feels safe, and that it's, it's a place of growth together. And that's what needs to take place at first. That will be the first unit, looking at language, looking at jargon, looking at different needs of different um, cultures, and just kind of exploring this together and kind of learning together. So that will be the first unit. Our next year will be uh, the Latinx experience, and uh, we have copies of different texts available if people are interested in looking at them firsthand as well, too, throughout all of these units, including the pre-unit section as well. Uh, for this piece, we're uh, going to focus on a lot of vignettes and short story pieces, uh, focusing on authors such as Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, author of one of my favorite short stories, The Handsomest Drowned Man in the World. He's known for, uh, he's known for a lot of his uh, kind of surrealist take uh, on, on pieces. We're also looking at a lot of humanity and interest interesting things like that. We have a lot by Sandra Cisneros, because Julie loves Sandra <laughs> Cisneros. <laughs> like her collection, The House on Mango Street, and Woman Hollering Creek as well, too. And then one of my personal favorite authors that actually I managed to teach while I was teaching her seventh grade many, many years ago, uh, Stories from El Barrio by Piri Thomas, who is a phenomenal author, uh, Puerto Rican American. He, uh, there's a short story that my seventh graders always hated because you never find out the ending, but it's called Amigo Brothers, about two boys who go boxing against each other. <laughs> and then uh, two other pieces that deal with, uh, including the wanting to have money so he can take his girlfriend out and then getting caught when he steals a quarter from his father, La Peseta, which is one of the funniest pieces that's also bilingual as well, too, that I've read in a long time, and The Conch, which deals with issues of natural hair in the Latin culture. We have some nonfiction pieces to pair with this as well, too, uh, including the, let's hear, uh, sorry, Cecilia Munoz's NPR piece, Getting Angry Can Be a Good Thing. We have selections from the documentary, Every Child is Born a Poet. It's about the life and works of Piri Thomas. The Wrath of Grapes, a uh, piece by Cesar Chavez, talking not only uh, about his work when it came to working with uh, farm workers, but also the kind of dangers that they faced as well, too, at the hands of pesticides. And selections from John Leguizamo's Latin History for Morons, which takes a humorous take at grappling with the fact that Latin history is often not taught at all in the school system, and how do we make amends with that? The second unit following the Latin section will be the LGBTQ plus section. Uh, for the fiction pieces, we found a couple of short story collections. The first one being All Out, No Longer Secret Stories of Queer Teens Throughout the Ages. This is uh, edited by Sandra Mitchell, and it features different 
young adult authors who are recontextualizing different pieces in history, adding in characters that didn't exist there before to create LGBTQ presences at different time periods and settings that we're also used to throughout literature, like medieval England or you know, Victorian times and things like that, but adding in characters that, are la that haven't been included in the past. We have a series of short stories uh, called Transcendent 1 and vo Volume 2, Transcendent, of course, 2, The Year's Best Transgender Speculative Fictions, speculative fiction being science fiction, fantasy pieces such as that. So we'll see a representation of transgender youth as characters in these pieces as well. Now, for the nonfiction pieces, uh, I focused on educating our students more on uh, transgender students, transgender identity, because as far as these concepts go into that's one that a lot of people need a lot of education on. So Transgender 101 is a text, a simple guide to a complex issue by Dr. Nicholas M. Teach. Uh, chapter one, it does an excellent job of laying out what it means to be transgender and to give us a working vocabulary to help us understand uh, the characters that we will encounter in the stories as well as uh, the piece Beyond Magenta, Transgender Teens Speak Out. It's a mixture of interviews with students as well as uh, photojournalism to get a chance to share their experiences of transitioning. All right, um, the third unit is Black American Voices. Um, right now, just so you know, on the actual sheet, it'll show you that we are moving the hate you give forward as the main anchor piece. That novel is going still through the process of a curriculum approval. I think we're at curriculum council right mm -hmm. now. Yes. Um, if that does not pass, we do have a novel in um, kind of the waiting. Right, listed just below it, yeah. Look Both Ways Look by both Jason ways. Reynolds. So we will have an anchor text there. Um, it's really important that the literature that we're picking and Tony already said it, is really celebrating the joy and genius of all these marginalized groups. Um, and so we, I, I love Amanda Gorman, and the kids are responding to her. I used her this year, even in my Brit Lit class. <laughs> so what? Um, <laughs> they loved it. They loved it. It was so cool to read the things that they wrote about her writing. Um, Gwendolyn Brooks, Clint Smith is a, a newer writer, and he is so powerful um, in his poetry. So we'll be using some of his um, as well. And just looking at some, um, both Kevin Hart, you can see is on there in the nonfiction piece, as well as Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History. It's just ways of celebrating the joy and genius of all these people. Um, and again, uh, one thing I'm excited about is the code switching and talking about that. And there's some great TED Talks out there on that. So we'll be using that as well. And then finally, that capstone where the kids will be researching um, a social action project and moving forward. And hopefully, if, if it goes well, you'll see and hear all about it this time next year. So that is our class. Right. Uh, are there any questions from the board that we can help clarify? It's not so much a question as a little comment. Um, you know, my children have had um, you as teachers, and you are both um, teachers that they talk about at home in a, the best way possible. Um, love both of you. Um, I think that your excitement and your enthusiasm is contagious and so I'm excited to see where this goes and how your students respond and if you guys are the ones that are teaching this class I'm sure it'll be a great success. So, so thank you for all the work you guys have done on this. Congratulations to the, the parents and the graduates. This is an exciting time. So I just wanted to say that. We've got a whole set of parents here. So congratulations. It's cool. I'm excited to share that with you. Any other? Yeah. Um, so I want to say that when I read through this, I was nervous and excited at the same time. Same. <laughs> um, and uh, I think for uh, full discretion, I mean disclosure, sorry, not discretion. Um, I was nervous, like, you know, is this something that, you know, y'all will be able to teach? So I asked some students, and all I said was Miss Smith, and I'm going to tell you what they told me. I, I talked to at least five students, different uh, academic standards for each of them, but every one of them said, if Miss Smith or Mr. Barroso did not teach that class, we're not taking it. 
And I'm like, how did you even know Mr. DeRosa was an option, right? So I guess it's a thing. So you know, it's very encouraging to hear that from kids who, you know, all they knew was I'm, I'm saying, hey, what's up with this class? And they said it without even thinking. Like, we absolutely would take it. We absolutely think it should be done. And so that is very, very encouraging. So I'm excited to see that. what happens. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I am none of the things that I'm supposed to be teaching, right? I am a white woman, straight, but I, I have diversity in my life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we confuse what a teacher is. Mm -hmm. A teacher is not someone who just stands in front of you and tells you what to think. We're like tour guides. We're there to help you and we learn. To, I, I want to express this so much. It's learning together. And I think that that's what's important. In our presence, someone asked what would happen if things go awry. I don't know if your students told you this. They're not going awry in my classroom. <laughs> 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 but, but that's that first piece, is creating the climate of what we expect and how we treat one another. And this is, it, it, it works. It'll work. And I will also say, I feel like that's one of the things that we miss so often when we're talking about equity and inclusion, um, is the fact that none of us know everything, and we don't know what we don't know. And if we don't have a space where we can say those things and get corrected, you know, however we need to get corrected, how, how else are we ever gonna learn? You know, and so I'm like, I'm really excited. I'm really grateful that you guys are bringing this. However it came about, I'm really excited about it. Thank you. So, well, um, I want to take this class. <laughs> um, I, I definitely appreciate all the work that has gone into this, and I think now is the time. Um, and I, I appreciate your trepidation because it's a difficult topic for adults, let alone students. Um, so thank you for putting this together. The one thing that I would say, or maybe you've already done this, is that um, possibly lean in on black and brown people, LGBTQ plus communities to help you guide through some of those difficult things that you might encounter. They might have a different perspective. They might be able to help you approach some of these things in, in different ways because we don't know everything. And then, um, do you anticipate how many sections you're going to be offering and what happens if you need to add more or is it just limited to a no, number of sections? Education should be limited. So right now it's open to whomever would like to. I checked on I don't know, Dave. Just a couple days ago? Thursday? I don't know, Dave. is today. I'm not being sick, so I'm just kind of like, what are we doing? Uh, I checked just a couple days ago, and we had, I think, two, two sections. a good solid two sections of kids. We're still missing about 30-ish juniors that need to still schedule. Um, the Brit Lit has a solid, robust section, it looks like, and AP's got a couple sections. And then the other thing that also gets me excited is the capstone part of it. And uh, I think it's awesome that we're helping to be that guider for our students. And sometimes that can trickle over into our communities, which I really hope that it does because we still have a lot of growth and a lot of learning to do in our own respective communities in Marshall and in Albion. So um, if there are ways, because I, I know if, if, if this is approved, I know there's going to be some parents that are probably um, going to be less than thrilled. Less than thrilled. Thank <laughs> you. And, and, and so <laughs> I think, I think we have to provide that vehicle for our parents, for our community to say, to open up their horizons as well. And if we can help to do that with the students through the council, it should
show them that we're not teaching a way, but we are helping them to understand and be understanding humans. I have a shirt that says, be a kind human. Yes. I wish I could wear 365 mm -hmm. days a year. Um, but I just, I'm excited. There's a lot of freedom for the kids in selecting. We're hoping a self-selected unit where they can pick a book written by a diverse author and do a book club. You know, we just, this is a, a first go. So we don't know how long is this going to take? How long is this going to take? What, you know, is there a pandemic going? I mean, you know, we just don't know what's coming. And so right now, <laughs> a lot of freedom for the children to explore um, and in that social action project. And I, I can't. I can't, and I got this from a conference. I, I went to a few conferences this year virtually, but um, there was a woman in the, the Michigan Department of Ed conference, and it just struck me as celebrate the joy and genius. How can you say no <laughs> to that? How can you poo poo that? You can't. The other thing I want to say is this kind of stuff is the stuff that's going to make an impact on kids' lives. Forever. When they look back at high school and they have a class, it's like, oh my gosh, that was so eye-opening. Like, this gets me excited about other things. <laughs> other things? Like, entrepreneurship and all of that fun stuff that yeah. um, kids remember and they learn like, experientially. Yes. Julie, Anthony, um, where are we at in the steps? of the uh, curriculum approval process at this point? On um, the class or the book? Yeah, the, the class. The class, we're... We are on um, so the We're steps up right now, right? So yeah, we're at the, the grand finale, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. This is it. And as far as the text and the supplementals, that's still being reviewed by the curriculum council? Um, this has all gone through the curriculum council. Everything that we have shared with them, <laughs> Um, the only piece that has not gone through the full approval process is the ADF. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to say one more thing. <laughs> because I can't forget this. So shout out to the juniors that you guys surveyed. I mean, I was like, I, my mind was blown at how many students said that they were going to sign up for this class. And like the rest of them were like AP. I was just like, that says a lot about a lot. So shout out to the juniors, soon to be seniors. I agree. They already have that. And in fact, I've asked a lot of all the undergraduate students to help guide a little bit and give me some feedback as what you know what works for that and what interested them. So there's a lot of value from that. They got part of it a little bit. You know, yeah. I, I, a lot of this stuff, especially in the Black Voices Unit, I already tried on my current seniors. I already took a test drive, and the car is bought. Like, okay. it's there. It's ready. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to D, high school learning and physiology textbook proposal. In your packet under 7D, you have this proposal. I don't think there's anyone here to speak to this, but we can read out loud in the background. In spring of 2020, the COVID restrictions, students were placed on virtual only learning. The fall of 2019, with COVID restrictions continuing, students were in an all-virtual or hybrid learning platform. With this new virtual platform came difficulties with our current text to engage students in daily lessons. There are now fantastic resources available to make this new way of learning engage, engaging and more accessible for students. Our current textbook does not offer an online platform as it was published in 2007. In addition, the adoption of the new Michigan standards in 2015, focusing on a three-dimensional approach, there is a need for a textbook that has greater alignment to this approach, including cross-cutting concepts, 
science and engineering practices, and disciplinary core ideas. This is being presented for your review. So I didn't have any questions about the um, proposals per se. I think the only question I had is when when do when do they need to be approved by us? Will they be in the next at the next board? Thirty days. So they'll be available for you to review and then we take action in thirty days. Okay. And we'll hold that text available at the superintendent's office and also at the high school. So my question is, is I thought last year in 2020 that we did approve some textbooks already and then and then COVID hit and then things just kind of you know the wheels kind of came off a lot of things because of COVID. So we were going to move forward with the purchasing of the textbooks that you guys had previously um, approved and then they were already updated and so this is to get us the newly updated version. Okay. There's a new, that's why these are coming back in front of you because what was last year is no longer there. Okay, this is better than that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And then in high school physics textbook proposal. High school physics textbook adoption proposal and packed under seven eight. Background, in November of 2015, the state of Michigan adopted the Michigan Science Standards. These new standards are performance-based standards that are essentially equal to the next generation science standards. The new standards incorporate a three-dimensional approach to learning science, cross-cutting concepts, science and engineering practices, and disciplinary core ideas. Our current textbooks are designed using our old curriculum and was published in 1995. The HMH Physics textbook was published in 2017 and has resources for NGSS alignment. Those will be available for review as well. Move on to eight action items, curriculum and instruction trips, um, A approved overnight and uh, A approved state field trips, and B approved overnight and one out of state trips. We give the background. Yeah, so please don't have me read all the uh, <laughs> Okay, so a lot of this is, is pretty much a routine that we do every year, but it's necessary to put this out publicly. Um, a is approval of overnight and or out of state field trips, and B is approval of overnight and or out of state trips. Background. Under A, these are the customary school sponsored overnight and out-of-state field trips conducted in Marshall Public Schools. They are being presented this time for board approval so that the sponsors in these trips may proceed with their planning and entire order for the 2021-22 school year. We have those listed. I guess I could probably at least two do the titles. The Metropolitan Trip for fourth grade. Sherman YMCA and Outdoor Center Camp in Augusta, Michigan um, for our sixth grade. FFA convention trip to Indianapolis for members 9 through 12. State FFA convention trip to Lansing uh, for members 9 through 12, possibly 7 through 8. Um, fall FFA leadership conference in Lansing for members 8 through 12. And NSC FFA Washington leadership conference in Washington, D.C. for members 11 through 12. And it's only a, a small number of students that go on that. The regional FFA leadership camp in Casopolis, Michigan, for chapter FFA officers only, 9th through 11th grade. The B is these are the customary overnight or out of state trips planned by current and or retired staff of Marshall Public Schools. They are being presented at this time for board approval so that the sponsors of these trips may proceed with their planning in a timely manner. should be noted that these trips are subject uh, to volunteer leadership, which includes planning, organizing, and accompanying students, as well as appropriate number of participants to support the trip. All trips presented are conducted in non or non-school days. Grade 5 optional student trip to Chicago. Um, grade 8 optional student trip to Northern Michigan. 
referred to as the Uper Wilderness Adventure. Grade 8 music uh, student trip to Sandusky, Ohio, basically to Cedar Point. Marshall Middle School optional student trip to East Coast. Trip is self-funded. Um, there's a lot of places they're visiting. You can read the detail. Marshall Coco um, Sister City Exchange Program uh, offers J uh, Japan Exchange each year with Marshall Middle School. Marshall High School Spanish optional student trip to Chicago for juniors and seniors. Marshall High School Club to travel to Lansing for the Michigan Youth and Government Conference. Marshall High School uh, band trip to travel to New York City in the spring of 2022. It's currently available. And it is a recommendation of the Superintendent of Action Items curriculum and instruction trips to be approved and presented. Support. Any discussion? It will be exciting to get back to doing some of these trips. I know that past students who have been on these trips remember them for a long, long time. They still talk about them, what they did in fourth grade and fifth grade, you know, now that they're graduating this year. So um, hopefully things will continue to get better and these trips will get put back in and we can have those students really benefit from all of these different trips that are being planned. That's exciting. Any other comments? Uh, I don't know who we're uh, at, so we'll start with me. Yes. Uh, yes. Lisa? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Alina? Yes. And Shana? Yes. Financial and approved setting of 2021-22 school lunch prices. Becky, would you handle the background, please? Yes. Uh, Section 205 of the Healthy Month for Free Kids Act of 2010 requires us to annually compare our district's average lunch prices with the federal reimbursement rate for free meals. This year, the federal government's target lunch price is $3.15 for the 2021-2022 school year. Our average lunch price for the 2020-2021 school year was $2.79. We are currently closing this gap over several school years starting with a 15 cent increase for the 2021 and the 2022 school year. Below our what the paid lunch prices will be, will be provided the recommendation is So our is paid well, it's going to go to $1.60, which is staying the same. This is staying at 50 cents. Lunch K through five is 290. Lunch six through eight is 295, and lunch nine through 12 is 305. And then adult lunches will be 390. It is the recommendation of the superintendent that action item financial be approved as presented. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Kelly. Yes. 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 Moving to 10, um, action item approved by CISD and minimum purchase procedures. As board to the general the June 7, 2021 CISD bilingual election and an alternate should that person be able to attend the board without considering resolution appointing a representative alternative and the board's candidate choices. Um, shall I read the resolution now before I make my recommendation or after? I'm um, sure you can read that. Okay, I'll read that now. Resolution of the Board of Education, where the biannual election of the Board of Calhoun School District will be held on May, Monday, June 7, 2021, at a meeting of representatives from constituent school boards, where Section 6142 of the Revised School Code requires a con, uh, constituent school district to designate its representative and identify the school board candidate, the board's 
that each position be filled on the, on the board by resolution adopted not earlier than 21 days prior to the date of the election. And whereas section 6142 prescribes the method for passage for a resolution, including the requirements of considering the resolution at least one public meeting before adopting the resolution. And whereas the board previously considered the resolution at an open meeting conducted in a manner prescribed under the Open Meetings Act on May 24, 2021 at 6.45 p.m. Now, therefore, be it resolved that, one, the board recommends Richard Lindsay as its representative to serve on the 2021 electoral body rep responsible for electing members to the Calhoun Intermediate School District Board of Education and as alter alternate representative in the event the designated representative is unable to attend. Two, the board supports candidate Richard Lindsay um, for the position on the Calhoun School District Board of Education for a term of six years. And three, the board has its representative to vote for candidate Lindsay um, at, at, hold on a second, at least on the first ballot taken at the June 7, 2021 election. And four, the board authorizes and directs the secretary to file this resolution with the secretary of the Calvin Intermediate School Board. It is a recommendation of the superintendent that this action item be approved as presented. Different motion? Support. Any discussion? Okay, Lisa? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Amanda? Yes. Yeah. Sean? Yes. Matt? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. comments for which no action may be taken at this point. Once again, congratulations to Josh Adams on your new position um, with the MYCA. Um, something that I don't think was mentioned tonight was um, Peter Meyer um, awarded his Congressional Matter of, Ma uh, of Merit to Nathan Mallet, and so I just want to publicly um, give a shout out to him for that. So I think that's a pretty amazing award to receive. And also to our soccer team for winning their sixth straight um, I-8 um, championship. So six is a pretty big number in a row. So that's awesome. Any other board comments? Okay, 12 uh, executive closed session. Um, recommended by the Education move into executive closed session student discipline hearing under Section 8B of the Open Meetings Act in regard uh, to disciplining of a student. Section? Support. Lisa? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Amanda? Yes. Sean? Yes. Matt? Yes. And Larry? Yes. Are we staying in here for that? I don't believe that should we be 